And uh, Kesha will talk about his glorious new uh, subconvexity result for GL3L functions. Please, let's not wait longer and uh, listen to Kesha. Thanks, thanks, Gage. Thanks for the kind introduction and thanks to the organizers for uh, the invitation. And so, uh, yeah, I'll just go ahead and uh, do this very brief introduction. So you guys have already seen this many, many times. But, uh, let me quickly just tell you that the whole point of uh, a convexity bound is that you know what's happening on the right of the real s equal to one line. And by functional equation, you know what's happening to the left of the real s equal to zero line. And then what happens in the middle, it can uh, basically be uh, determined by what's happening on the two ends. And so here I'm plotting the exponent of growth. So you know that it converges absolutely on the right. So the exponent of growth is zero. And by functional equation and Stirling's approximation, uh, you know that the exponent of growth is half minus sigma. And so what happens in the middle, you just join it by a line and you get this exponent of one by four, the convexity. Yeah, I can't hear you. you cannot hear me? Uh, am, I, am I audible to the online audience? Absolutely. Okay, great. Uh, maybe I'll just speak louder. Okay. We have the best view and the best sound, advantage of not being on site. <laughs> Great. Uh, all right. So now it's good. All right. And so uh, let me uh, go to GL2 and uh, rigorously define the upper half plane just for the younger audience who may not have seen. Uh, the idea is that uh, this is the group SL2R uh, of these matrices of determinant one that act on the upper half plane. And uh, the action is given by if there's a Z uh, on the upper half plane, uh, the matrix has, acts as AZ plus B over CZ plus D. And it's a well-defined action because if you uh, calculate its imaginary part, you can see it turns out to be Y over CZ plus D modulus squared, which is positive. And so this action takes something on, on the upper half plane to the upper half plane. And uh, also notice that this action is transitive. So that is, uh, you give me two points and you can get a matrix that takes one point to the other point. And you can see that by the action of this matrix uh, on I that takes it to X plus IY, right? Uh, and therefore uh, the upper half plane is, can, can be thought of as topologically isomorphic to SL2 or model of the stabilizer. And you can calculate the stabilizer and the stabilizer of I, for example, you just do this uh, calculation and you can see it is SO2R. And that is where this SO2R is coming and the upper half plane therefore is uh, isomorphic to SL2 mod SO2. And therefore the generalized upper half plane, uh, the model is SLN modded by SON. So if uh, there's someone who has not seen, this is the calculation that follow through. And uh, let me also rigorously define GL3 uh, and uh, as in the mass forms on GL3R. Uh, like we did for uh, n equals two, you can do for n equals three, you can define this upper half plane. You have this X and the Y component that you can somehow thought as the real and the imaginary parts. And uh, you have these matrices, uh, that is you have this decomposition of a point on the upper half plane. And uh, you can define mass forms for that. Uh, you look at the center, of, uh, the center of the universal enveloping algebra of this of GL3. And then you can define these functions that are eigenfunctions of all the uh, differential operators. Uh, very standard uh, theory, uh, you can, for example, read it in Goldfield's textbook, a very standard textbook. And a mass form of GL3 of a certain type uh, is a smooth function on the L2 space that has some good properties. So there is the modularity condition that uh, also then that it's an eigenfunction for all these differential operators. And then there's a moderate growth condition. Uh, very similar to what you will see on GL2, the, your, your standard usual uh, holomorphic and mass forms. And how do we define the L functions? Well, uh, there are uh, Fourier Whittaker expansions for these uh, forms. And once again, uh, this is something that is again a standard theory, but for the ones who have not seen, uh, the whole idea is that there is a Fourier expansion and there are these Fourier coefficients that appear. And we are interested in studying uh, the Fourier coefficients and we are interested in studying the L function that is defined by uh, these Fourier coefficients. Uh, the great thing is that this L function has an Euler product and it has a function equation. Once again, all of this is very standard theory, uh, very good uh, textbook is Goldfield's uh, textbook. You can go and uh, read the theory of uh, automorphic forms on, on GLM. So after defining what we are working with, uh, 
let's go ahead and talk about the kind of problems that we are looking at. It's subconvexity for GLN L functions. Uh, the standard L function will have degree n. So I'm just focusing on uh, convexity or subconvexity bounds in the T aspect. That is, you fix the form and you let this IT component go to infinity. Uh, and we are on the critical line. So the conductor is defined as uh, one plus T uh, raised to the N, of course, uh, with uh, the parameters that this form may depend on. And the convexity bound, as we have seen so many times, is the quarter power of this conductor. And the subconvexity estimate is a saving in this N over four. And now there are two uh, important uh, landmarks in this. Uh, one is the Burgess type bound and one is the wild type bound. We keep seeing them for some reason. It must be a deeper theory, which will be interesting to explore in its own right. But the Burgess type bound is the exponent of three over 16 of this conductor. And the wild type bound is one sixth of the conductor. And reaching these milestones in itself uh, is very interesting. And then improving upon these milestones uh, is more interesting. And so uh, some relevant literature, uh, a lot of results you have already seen as mentioned. There are some other very important results that are not mentioned here, uh, but uh, you know, they are not in the T aspect. Uh, so let me start with the first one. This is uh, attributed to the methods of while, but really due to Hardy and Littlewood and then written out by Landau. Uh, the exponent of T to the one over six uh, for the Riemann zeta function. Uh, this was extended to GL2. Uh, forms, the first for holomorphic by Anton Good, and then by Tom Moman and then uh, Marty Utla, uh, they covered this uh, forms that are uh, holomorphic or Hecke mass for GL2 uh, of level one. And they found the same exponent one by three, uh, the same exponent in the sense that the conductor is T squared now. So T to the one third should be thought of as T squared to the one sixth. Once again, something that you have seen mentioned uh, in this conference. Uh, another important one is by Duke Friedlander and Ivanich. It's not a T aspect result, but the reason I mention it is uh, basically the first time in this uh, invention as paper, they have uh, the Duke Friedlander Ivanich, their delta method developed. Uh, going on to higher GLN, the first result for GL3L functions was by Xiaoxing Li's uh, beautiful paper where she uh, went ahead and uh, used the ideas of Conry and Ivanich and got this exponent of uh, 3 4 minus one over 16. Uh, note that 3 4 is the convexity estimate and the saving of one over 16 over there. And here, the important thing is that uh, she needed uh, non-negativity of the central values of certain GL3 cross GL2 uh, L functions. And that's why uh, she has to take uh, these GL3 forms to be self dual This was uh, generalized by Munshi to uh, all the GL3 cross forms, uh, but by very different methods, uh, his delta method that we have seen mentioned once again quite a few number of times. Uh, going back to Xiaoxing Li, uh, so as we have seen in Yung Shaolin's talk today, uh, Xiaoxing uh, Li used uh, uh, an average, a, a first moment average of a family of GL3 cross GL2 L functions. And this was studied by Meki, uh, Sun, and Ye, where they have a more robust stationary phase analysis and analysis of exponential integrals. And they were able to improve her exponent, but once again, for self-dual uh, Hegekas forms for GL3. And then Raman Nunes improved that exponent uh, even further. Uh, I was able to uh, improve Munchi's exponent. So here I don't need it to be self-dual. And so as of now, uh, we have that uh, the best result for uh, GL3 in the T aspect was 3040, which was recently improved in collaboration with uh, Joseph Lang and Rita Bratamunshi for any GL3 uh, Hecke maskers form L function for in the T aspect. And uh, you heard Yung Shaolin's talk today in the morning where he has an even stronger exponent. It's, this is 3 over 4 minus 3 over 20. And this is basically the best exponent which is known uh, for cell dual forms. We have also heard Paul Nelson's talk uh, where he has proved the subconvexity for standard L function for GLN, where the exponent uh, is n by four minus some delta n uh, that, that may depend on it. Uh, there are of course, uh, many other very important, very beautiful results, uh, of course, by Gerge, you have by Valentin Bloma, and you have many other authors who have proved important results in the level aspect, uh, not just the T aspect. 
and those techniques are also very important to study. But over here, I'm just going to restrict uh, to mentioning these results. And so the main result uh, in this uh, lecture is going to be about a second, a short second moment average of NL function. So we are studying a short second moment average uh, of NL function uh, of a GL3 Hekemaskas form. And this uh, short moment is uh, of length t to the two thirds. And we get a bound of t to the five over four on the right side. And using that, uh, we get the subconvexity estimate. You take the square root of that. So the exponent is five over eight and five over eight is three fourth minus one eighth. Okay, so that's, that's the main result. And I'm going to talk about uh, this uh, second moment average. Maybe I'll pause here for a bit in case you have any questions. All right. So uh, let me also again uh, go to what was happening in the last few years. Uh, the, uh, okay. Ah, all right. Uh, so uh, we have this uh, delta method approach. We consider the sum of a form. Uh, let's say it goes from y to y plus x, and you have two coefficients, a n and b n, uh, two arithmetically interesting coefficients. Uh, the idea is that we can separate the oscillations. This is a very, very general uh, setting uh, happening pretty much uh, a lot of times when this delta met method is applied. And so the idea is that you, instead of a single sum, you have a double sum. And let's say that the second sum is smoothed out by some uh, weight function. And you want to detect that when n equals r, so that uh, this collapses, the double sum collapses back to a single sum. And what is crucial, as we have seen even in the last talk, is that the choice of the delta symbol is very important. So we have to be careful about it. We have to be clever about it. And that brings us to what are different uh, delta methods uh, that appear and that exist and that people have used. Uh, the starting of all this can be thought of as this uh, orthogonality relation. If you integrate uh, e to the two pi i and x uh, over the interval zero to one, uh, then you get either a zero or a one. And you have to be then clever about it. So there is this Klusterman refinement as Pankaj was, was talking about, uh, where you use uh, Fari fractions uh, and you dissect all of your zero one interval and you get this kind of a delta symbol. Uh, and the thing to note here is that this sum, it's a double sum. You have Q many frequencies uh, going from one over big Q and then you have other, other Q many frequencies. So, in all, you have Q squared many additive frequencies in order to detect when a, a certain integer is zero or not. And then you have Duke Friedlander Ivanietz's delta method. Here I'm writing the Fourier transform version of it, where you have once again Q squared many frequencies in order to detect when a certain number is zero or not. And here G is a well behaved weight function. Right? Uh, the philosophy will be that the number of harmonics needed to detect when certain thing is equal to zero is approximately going to be the size of the equation. But uh, we are going to win and we are going to get some saving. We are going to get a subconvexity estimate or we are going to get some other estimates precisely because we are able to choose the number of harmonics to be a little less than the size of the equation. And for that, we are going to uh, make uh, use of these integrals and the cancellations in these integrals. Okay, so another tool that has been mentioned and that we will use uh, is the approximate uh, functional equation. So we know that uh, you, we have this Dirichlet series of uh, an L function, but it is defined to the, real, uh, to, to the right of uh, real s equal to one. And we are interested in what's happening on the critical strip and uh, on the critical line. And for that, we have the approximate functional equation. It, it says approximate, it's an exact uh, thing, but approximate in the sense of uh, what you can do is you can write the L function as a sum of uh, Dirichlet polynomials, uh, smooth Dirichlet polynomials. And the length of these Dirichlet polynomials is a uh, square root of the conductor. So the conductor here is T cubed. The square root of the conductor is three half uh, with an epsilon uh, safety valve. We have two uh, smooth, uh, smooth out Dirichlet polynomials of length T to the three half plus epsilon. And here this epsilon pi is the root number. Uh, which is size one. So we can study either of these uh, two things and get an estimate to get an estimate on the L function. 
uh, what we can further do is uh, we can take this thing, uh, this uh, V1 and V2 are uh, cut off from, let's say, 0 to T to the 3 half. Uh, we can now have a uh, you know, smooth bump functions. That's a partition of unity. And divide this uh, one uh, the 0 to T to the 3 half into dyadic segments of length, let's say, n to 2n, where n runs from 1 to T to the 3 half. So once again, all of these are very standard things uh, in the application. But the whole point is that uh, first you have the L function, you have the approximate functional equation to uh, study what's happening on the critical line. And then you have these dyadic uh, partitions uh, to study uh, what's happening uh, from n to 2n uh, when the, the index is running from let's say big n to big 2n. All right. And so Munchi's original approach in his proof of uh, GL3T aspect uh, subconvex bound uh, was that uh, you look at uh, this Sn and the single sum is written as a double sum. And here the double sum is collapsed by using that R equals N, but Munshi uh, added another ingredient to it that uh, he called the conductor dropping trick, which basically makes sure that R and N to begin with are not too far apart. Because in the beginning, if you have two variables R and N, both R and N can run up to, you know, of size big N. But then in, in reality, we know that R has to be equal to N. So we can introduce uh, this extra, uh, extra uh, delta method or an extra integral to detect when R and N are close by. They don't run just a mock all the way to size N. They are of size N over K, where this, uh, this uh, K is going up to, let's say, size N to the 1 minus epsilon. And we'll have to choose what the size of K is. Uh, then uh, the improvement that I had mentioned earlier in one of the results was basically an, uh, an observation that if you use the delta method and you use the uh, cancellations in the integrals in those delta methods, then you don't quite need this conductor dropping phenomenon. And uh, some, of the, uh, some of the calculations, they just clean up and you just get a better exponent. And uh, I really follow Munchi's uh, trick, uh, Munchi's approach and uh, get just a little better exponent. But this seems to be the, uh, the stretch of this method. Uh, improving upon this exponent using this approach seems uh, uh, not possible. It seems to be the limit. And so in Munchi's approach, uh, once you have the delta symbol, the next steps are apl application of like dual summation formulas, you know, Poisson and Voronoi, uh, stationary phase analysis, cauchy schwartz inequality, and some other dual summation formulas. Uh, something like maybe what you might have seen in uh, Malaysian stock. Uh, Malaysian, at the end of the day, he does something more. Uh, he has uh, these, uh, 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 these exponent pairs as well in order to improve uh, on the sub -y. But the first few steps are basically these, right? Okay, so I, I know I've been going a little fast, uh, being a little late. Uh, so I'll maybe pause here for a bit in case uh, anyone has any questions. Right. Um, if not, uh, let's go ahead and let me once again say the summary of uh, many proofs that you would have seen in this uh, recipe uh, is you start with an approximate functional equation, then you apply a delta symbol or a circle method. This is followed by, because now you have two sums in the, instead of a single sum, it's followed by application of Voronoi formulas or Poisson formula to dualize these uh, summations. Uh, that gives you certain integral transforms that you need to analyze. So you apply stationary phase analysis, for example, or some other methods to uh, analyze uh, the cancellations in these integrals. Uh, at this step, uh, you know, these dual summation formulas are involutions. So you cannot just apply dual summation formula again, because then you'll go back to what you started with. So you have to do something about it. So you break the symmetry, you change the nature of the problem by applying a cauchy schwartz inequality. Uh, that maybe drops the problem from like a GL2 problem to a GL1 problem or a GL3 problem to a GL1 problem. That is, you get rid of some Fourier coefficients and then uh, you can apply a dual summation formula again. So you go ahead and you apply Poisson formula and uh, that's how you are able to get a new length of summation. Uh, you'll have some new integral transforms. You analyze those in integral transforms and you get your final bounds. So that was the recipe in uh, many of the proofs that you would have seen. And so that brings us to uh, the topic of this talk, which is boundingness, uh, a short second moment average 
of uh, GL3L functions. And so the idea is that uh, if you look at a short second moment average, short in the sense that M does not, uh, this, this moment average is not from T to 2T or zero to, uh, zero to T, it's like T minus M to T plus M, and it's a second moment. If you get a bound of, let's say that this is smaller than B, uh, the bound on the L function will be the square root of B uh, with the safety valve of T to the epsilon. And therefore, if you can make sure that this B is uh, smaller than T to the three half minus Delta, uh, you are done. You have a subconvex T estimate. And so uh, what we will try to do here is, uh, what I will try to do here is uh, first show you how you can reach uh, the so far best known saving of three over 40. And then uh, what you can do to get uh, past it and improve that bound. Right. All right. So then uh, let's look at this second moment, the short second moment average. And let's apply the approximate functional equation to begin with. So we are writing, and uh, now a lot of things are going to happen in sketch. So when I say that n is uh, of size n and r is of size n, uh, there are these smooth weight functions that always appear. Right? So everything is smoothed out. You can apply your dual summation formula. So things are like uh, well behaved. And so if you apply uh, approximate functional equation, you will see that you have a double sum because of the uh, second moment, this, this double sum is not because of any delta method right now, it's just because of the second moment. And you have two sums, you have the n sum and the r sum. Uh, you have the two coefficients, lambda one n and lambda r one. Uh, lambda r one is the complex conjugate of lambda one r. And then you have this integral t minus m to t plus n. And this, uh, you have n over r to the iv dv. Right? And so now you can analyze this integral, uh, notice what happens. If you uh, go ahead and do integration by parts, uh, right, many times integration by parts, uh, what you end up uh, seeing is that this is concentrated around the point T. So N over R to the IT pops out, but then uh, this integral is of size M. And if you do integration by parts, uh, what you see is that if N and R, the small N and small R are too far apart, you get uh, the arbitrary saving. And so this integration uh, is like a conductor dropping. It just makes sure that N and R are close by and how close are they? They are closer than N over M. And you have an extra factor of big M appearing just because of the evaluation, uh, just because of the length of this integral. And at this point, you can think of this variable R as the shift. So R is N plus H. And now you have a shifted sum. You have a shifted sum here. And with that, you have E of H T over N. And why do you get this E of HT over N? Uh, well, if you look at N over R to the IT, R is N plus H. And this is a small calculation. You can just write this as an exponential of the log, and then you can expand the log. Since H is uh, a shift uh, smaller than at most N, uh, you can uh, expand this shift. And what survives is this leading term. And the leading term survives as long as you know that this M uh, that, that you're taking is big enough. So you want to make sure that all the smaller order terms are small. So let's just take this M to be at least square root of T. Okay. Uh, we will end up choosing M to be bigger than square root of T. So it's not going to really hurt us. So that this is one of the baseline assumptions over here. And these shifts are going up to size big N over big N, but I am going to in the sketch form, just take the worst. So the assumption once again, or the hope is that if you are able to do what's happening for the biggest shift, then you can able, you, you, you will be able to handle the smaller shifts as well. So for us, uh, let's remember that the size of the shift is n over m. Okay. All right. So that was just the second moment average and uh, converting the problem to a shifted uh, sums uh, twisted by an additive character. All right. And so now we come to the second step, which is application of a delta sum. So notice, uh, let me go back one slide, sorry. So this uh, script M, this right now, if you just put absolute values everywhere and let's, let's say you assume the Ramanujan bound, uh, let's say this is in, uh, you know, end of the epsilon, end of the epsilon, and this exponent is of size one, uh, you should see that all of this is really of size N. It is of size NH, which is of size big N. So to begin with, our sum is of size uh, big O of uh, big N, and now if you apply the Delta symbol, uh, you should expect that things are doubling. And that's why this is of size N squared. 
And so this is the delta symbol application that we have done. Uh, notice that there's a Q sum and this X integral and this A mod Q sum appearing from the delta symbol. And now notice that there is the H which was as earlier, but now you have two sums. You have an N sum and an R sum because of the application of the delta symbol. And if you bound the trivial bound is going to be of big of big O of N squared. So now uh, if you want to get a subconvex bound, you want to save N and a little more in order to get to the convexity and now below convexity. Uh, notice once again, as I had said earlier, that uh, this Q, which is uh, the parameter appearing from the delta symbol, that should be, uh, you know, in, in order to get a subconvex bound, that should be a little smaller than square root of n. And this little smaller, let's say that it's parameterized by some parameter of size k. So if we are able to choose uh, some big k so that uh, it's you know, not as big as n, we'll be able to choose q a little smaller than square root of n. And then the hope is that you can get a saving over the convexity estimate. All right. So we have these shifts, h, which is n over m. Uh, let's also uh, make sure that this is smaller than q squared. And if that happens, then this shift E H X over Q Q. So you should see that uh, this exponent, this H times X over Q Q appears here. This is going to be flat. Uh, by flat, what I mean is that it's not oscillating. That's because this X is of size one, this H is at most of size H. And once again, in the sketch form, let's assume that this small Q is of size big Q. So this fraction H X over Q Q is almost of size one or smaller. And therefore, this complex exponent, it does not oscillate. And therefore, you can absorb it in the weight functions, and you don't have to really worry about its analysis or its cancellations when we are doing uh, the calculation. Uh, second thing is, uh, let's see, let's estimate how big we might want to choose this Q. And for that, uh, right now, it looks like the N variable and the R variable should behave in the same way. They are symmetric, because that's how they, they have appeared here. And so let's uh, match up the oscillation of e to the rx over qq, this is the analytic part, or e to the nx over qq, with the oscillation of e of ht over n. Uh, sorry, this has to be a small t, not a big t. So let's match up these oscillations. And let's estimate what happens if you, we match up these oscillations. That will give us an idea about what q to choose. Uh, if we do that, uh, notice that ht over n has to be matched with n over q squared. And so, you know, Q squared is N over K, and you should be therefore choosing K to be of size T over N. And so these are some of the observations uh, in the sketch uh, that, that will help us if we remember that. And then, uh, you know, of course, you don't have to assume any of it. This is just for the sketch form, just to tell you the story ahead of time so that you can keep it in mind and you can, you know, convert the variables and see what's happening later on. And so now let's go ahead. Uh, so we, we are going to now start with this uh, M sum. Uh, after the application of the, de the delta method, we are going to apply dual summation formulas. So once again, this is the M sum. And uh, let me quickly tell you where all these different sums were coming from. We had the H sum right here, which was coming from the shift. We had the double R sum and the N sum that was coming because we had applied the uh, delta symbol. And we had the A sum and the Q sum from the de from this D DFI delta symbol, and the X integral again from the delta symbol. And now we are going to apply dual summation formulas to each of these three sums: the H sum, the N sum, and the N sum. And so let's start with the H sum that does not have any Fourier coefficients in it. Notice what's happening here: you have oh, I'm sorry, uh, once again a typo. This should be a uh, this should have been a plus, not a minus. So this is exponent of a h over q, uh, h t over n, and h x over q q. And notice that you have a h over q over here. So you have an arithmetic part and you have an analytic part. And if you apply a dual summation formula, a few things change. Uh, the first thing you should notice what changes is the length of the summation. And how does that change? Uh, the length of the summation to begin with is of size big H. And the new length of the summation is going to be conductor over the original length. Now the conductor is something which, uh, which uh, encodes the complexity of your given sum. And that is encoded in two parts. Uh, there's uh, this arithmetic complexity and the analytic complexity. And this AH over Q encodes the arithmetic complexity. It's, uh, it's, it's a discrete sum. 
And this HT over N plus HX over QQ encodes the uh, analytic complexity, the, the continuous part. And so the arithmetic complexity is of size Q, the denominator, and that's this Q coming over here, while the analytic complexity is of size HT over N. And uh, remember from the last slide, we had matched the size of HT over N and HX over QQ. And we have this HT over N. So the total complexity of this part is the product of these things, which is Q times HT over N. You divide by the original length, which is H, and the new length you get is QT over N. On the other hand, uh, you have a dual sum. Uh, that is, uh, you have this uh, congruence condition appearing because of Poisson formula, and you have a certain integral transform uh, that we'll worry about later. Come again. Sorry, thank you. Yeah, this alpha should be A. Thank you. All right. So we can apply the Voronoi formula, a dual summation formula to the R sum as well. And once again, very similarly, uh, this you have a dual length uh, from big N, you go to a different length. And let me quickly, once again, repeat how you get the, uh, the dual length. You have HR over Q, which encodes the arithmetic complexity of size Q. You have RX over QQ, which encodes uh, the analytic complexity of size N, A, N over QQ. And now you cube everything because you have a Fourier coefficient of a GL3 cusp form appearing here. And so the conductor is Q cube multiplied by N over small cubic Q cubed, and you divide by the original length. So the new length is N squared over Q cubed. And of course, you have uh, the Klusterman sums appearing here, uh, maybe something that we had seen in Lin's talk in the morning. And you have an integral transform over here. Uh, and this NRW to the one third is actually appearing because of the Bessel function that appears after the Warner formula. So we have, we have applied so far a Poisson formula to the H sum, a Warner formula to the R sum. We apply a Warner formula to the N sum. A very similar story. You have a Klusterman sum appearing. You have the N squared over Q cube length, and you have certain in integral transforms. And so let me just put everything together and see what, what has happened so far. We have had a second moment average. Then we applied a delta symbol. Then we applied uh, dual summation formulas to everything. And that brings us to new lengths of these variables, which are these. Uh, remember that Q is of size square root of N over K and K is of size T over M. And so this new length of H is of this size. Uh, you have Klusterman and sums appearing from the Warner formulas that we have to be sure about. And you have these integral transforms. And so now at this point, uh, I'm not going to tell you all the calculations, uh, but uh, what you can do is you can look at what the original size is and what the new size is. For example, the original size on the left side here, let's say that you assume Ramanujan, the original size of this sum is n, just big n, because this exponent is of size one and this lambda is, let's say is of size uh, n to the one plus epsilon. And so the size over here on the left side is of size n to the one plus epsilon. On the other hand, you can you know, put absolute values on the right side. Uh, let's say you apply the way bound to the Klusterman sums, you sum it up, uh, this integral is of size one. If you do all of that, you can see that it has another size. And so now you're, you're going from a size on the left to a size on the right. And therefore you can think of the saving in this process to be the size on the left divided by the size on the right. Because if you have uh, gone smaller, the saving is something which is more than one. And so that's what I'm saying over here. So when we apply this Poisson formula, Voronoi formula, Voronoi formula, and you bound the character sums, these, these character sums using the way bound, the total saving that we have obtained so far is going to be of all of this size, which is m squared over t to the threefold. So if you want, you can write it uh, for later, and you can see that all the savings are adding up, up to a certain point, and uh, that we are getting that kind of a saving in the end. Okay. All right. So, so far we have applied all the dual summation formulas and uh, things will start to get interesting. So maybe I will pause here for a bit. Uh, sorry, uh, what is uh, the sm small t? Oh, sorry, yeah, so the small t is the big t, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry about this. Uh, Thing. So this T is this parameter, uh, the T aspect parameter, which goes off to infinity. So for now, T is just something large and all of the other parameters uh, depend on the size of T. They're also growing large as T be becomes big. Sorry. 
for now small t is fixed yes yes right for now small t is fixed anything else uh, can you say it louder please Ah, sorry, this has to be an R again. I think I just copy pasted this and forgot to change that. Thanks. Sorry about that again. So this has to be an R going soft size. And... Oh, this one. Ah, so this has to be an N. Yeah. You just absorb this in the weight function. Yeah. You don't worry. I mean, let's say it had oscillations, then we've lost on it, but then it does not have oscillations. So we are fine. All right. Great. Anything else? All right. So let's move on. So, so far we have applied dual summation formulas and let's analyze the integral transforms. So uh, from each uh, summation formula, you had an integral transform and you had this X integral as well from this uh, Delta symbol. And now let's see what's happening over here. Uh, notice that each of these THY over NZ, HHY over Q, each of these is at most of size big N over small cubic Q. Right. And so uh, if it so happens that you have a perturbation of the opposite size, the inverse size QQ over big N, uh, the total size is going to be of size one. That is the size of the perturbation multiplied by the size of that oscillation is going to be of size one, which once again inside this complex exponent is going to be like a flat function. So that you can absorb it inside uh, the inside any weight function, and so a big part of the paper is uh, analyzing these integral transforms. That's why I'm taking one slide to just uh, tell you in very brief what's happening, uh, what the root of all of this is, and so the y integral, which was coming out of the Poisson formula, notice that the y integral are these first two terms once again with weight functions, and so if you have uh, integration by parts, repeated integration by parts. You get a saving uh, if you have such a condition. But if you, you, you get a saving if you don't have such a condition. So the condition is th over nz minus hh over q is of size big O of one. Can I go back to Poisson on the x term right here? Yes, right here. Right. You, you absorb it in the weight function. Yes. Uh, yes. Then you get the y and the two variables together, and you get that. Like your y over n. Oh, no, you do not. You do not. You will not. Uh, Would you like, apply the differences in the same So maybe, maybe this is what you're talking about, y over z, yes. something like this? Okay, so okay, so 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 not W, but the other variable. Yeah, you do get this. Why was it? Yes. Yeah. So I believe that is appearing. Oh, uh, all right. So uh, the next time I will just repeat the question. So the question was that uh, in this Poisson formula, when you apply the Poisson formula, should you be getting something like y over W or y over Z, uh, where y and Z are variables appearing from two. Uh, uh, formulas uh, y appearing from Poisson and z appearing from Wormai. And, and the answer is yes, you do. Uh, notice that I have taken out the y integral. Uh, this thy over nz is precisely as you had asked. And so if you take y common, it, it is th over nz minus hh over q, which has to be of size one by repeated integration by parts. All right. And uh, so yes. It's also smooth in q. Sorry. Is it smooth in Q? Is it a smooth function and not too restricted to? Uh, it is. And you know it explicitly or it's not needed? It's not needed. Sir, you just need that it is bound. small. Sir, yeah, you just need it. Sir. You just need the bound. You just need the bound. You will oscillate the integral as amplitude one. So it's just a phase integral. It's just exactly. But you know, I'm just uh, capturing it here. Later on, you will see that you just need to bound it and you are fine. Doesn't matter. Just writing out all the integrals that we have. Anything else? And you could take out y integral from first step itself. Certainly. 
Certainly. And then work with W and Z. So it's just a convolution there, basically. Certainly, certainly. You're right. You're right. I see. You're right. You're exactly right. So you, you can first apply a goal summation and then you can analyze the integral transform and then apply the next goal summation, then apply the, you know, uh, try to see what the integral transform is. But you can first apply these things. You can see some things are independent and then you can do the similar calculations. So yeah, these, these processes commute. And so what you should observe here is that uh, this uh, Z variable appearing from this Gorma formula uh, is of size like QT over HN plus a very small variable. And now this variable is of size smaller than QQ over big N. So this perturbation is of uh, that small size so that uh, if you multiply it by the oscillation inside this exponent, it's of size one, so it is flat. And so what the Y integral gives you is that the Z integral itself can be done, done away with. Uh, Z integral is something which is concentrated around QT over HN, but it itself is of size QQ over big N. So you can replace this Z integral by uh, the variable QT over HN, and you can then account for the length of the psi integral, which is of size QQ over N, and that's precisely what we do here. So going from this integral transform to that is accounting for the size QQ over N, and you have this W integral remaining, and of course you have the X. Come again. Later on. Which integral? Giant yes, we will treat that uh, later on. Uh, trivially. Right? So once again, in the sketch, uh, uh, this is basically what you should expect to happen. And then you have this oscillation, a lot of oscillation in the W integral. And uh, for uh, analyzing that, you have to do a robust stationary phase analysis. Once again, uh, in the paper, you will see that you have to break it up into cases uh, so that the oscillations can be big or small, but then the length of the variables are also big or sm uh, small or big so that things are uh, in control. And that's how you get another saving out of the analysis of this W integral. Uh, you get an extra factor of QQ over big N, the square root of that. So that in red is this extra factor that is appearing out of the analysis of all of these integrals. So that was the analysis that's in the sketch form, the analysis of all of these integrals. Okay. And so uh, we, you, you can like note that, keep it aside. Uh, and then now the next step is going to be, uh, we are going to look back at that uh, sum where we have already analyzed these integrals. And now we are going to uh, put an absolute value sign but we are going to take this Q sum and the H sum outside and the N and the R sum inside and put absolute values, but not all the way inside because we still want to preserve these oscillations of uh, this exponent. And now we are going to apply cauchy schwarz inequality. So we apply the cauchy schwarz inequality uh, while taking the Q sum and the H sum outside and we have the N sum and the R sum inside. And what we get is that this M star, so this M was bounded by M star and this M star is bounded by square root of S1, S2. And uh, S1 over here is this sum that has the N sum inside and you have the S2 sum where you have the R sum inside. Okay. And, uh, okay, so a comment on this, uh, doing so may not look like the best strategy. That's because uh, in all of these applications somehow, uh, what you want to do is uh, later on apply another dual summation formula. And so you will gain if you are taking the longer length of sum outside and putting the shorter length of sum inside. But we have done the exact opposite. Uh, you can calculate, you can see for yourself that the n sum is the longer one over here. So uh, it, it will be beneficial for us if we are able to somehow swap the two sums, the n sum to the outside and the h and q sums to the inside. Uh, but the good thing about this uh, kind of a thing is that now the S1 sum is independent of the M sum and the S2 sum is independent of the R sum. So we have already separated the two N and the R sums. And that brings us to the duality principle because we want to now swap the QH sum inside and the H, N and R sums outside this uh, absolute value square. And uh, once again, we have seen the duality principle. Uh, Matt Young also mentioned this. And... Uh, what you can do is uh, apply the duality principle and you can swap. You can swap the HQ sum with the R sum or the HQ sum with the N sum. And notice that uh, you should be taking supremum over certain coefficients. These are certain complex numbers uh, that depend on H and Q 
coming because of this duality principle. And you have the n squared over q cube, which is basically the length of these n sum and the r sum that have popped out outside. And so at this point, uh, you have a very similar structure. You have these beta hqs appearing. Uh, you have these Klusterman sums, and you have certain uh, you have certain oscillations appearing over here. And you have the n sum and the r sum that have the same length. So I am going to combine these, and I am going to just call it like an m sum. This m variable can be n or r, and you have these sjs. Uh, this j is one or two. So this s one and s two is bounded by a sum like this where this is a certain uh, oscillatory integral uh, that we will have to take care of or analyze later on. But for now, let me just show you how at this step itself, you can get back the three over 40 saving, and then we will see how to improve that. So at this point, let's open the absolute value squared. So let's go back to the n sum. Notice that, uh, notice that the n sum had this exponent, uh, this complex exponent. So let me just write down that on the next slide. And let's look at the S1 sum, uh, the S1, uh, the n sum over here. Open the absolute value squared, and let's see what happens here. So if you open the absolute value squared, you have two Qs. Uh, you have Q1 and Q2, and you have two copies of H. This is H1 and H2. And then you have the Klusterman sum uh, of H1 bar mod Q1 and H2 bar mod Q2. And so now let's apply uh, a dual summation formula to this thing. At this point, I'm not going to tell you uh, exactly all the details of how things work, but you have seen that you get a dual length, you get uh, another kind of a structure, that is you get a dual arithmetic side, you get some integral transforms. So let me just tell you what happens if you bound these things. So if you bound these things, uh, the saving that you get in the diagonal term, uh, the diagonal term being when n is equal to zero, so that h1 and h2 are the same, and q1 and q2 are the same. Uh, the, the saving that you get in the diagonal term is of size big M, and the saving that you get in the off diagonal term is of size n to the three half over QQ. And so now uh, it of course makes sense to match these two savings. So if you match these two savings, the size of big M, uh, recall that this big M was the size of your short second moment. So the size of this big M is T to the three fifth. And then uh, the saving, if you were noting things down, what you will have from all the previous steps is uh, T to the three fourth M to the one half. Uh, the saving from this uh, analysis of S1 is of size M, but remember that it was inside the square root. And so you get a saving of size square root of m from the S1 sum. Uh, let's hope that you will get a similar saving from the S2 sum as well of size square root of m. And so you multiply all of this. Uh, remember that m is of this size so that the saving that you get is size t to the 3 fourths plus 9 10. And therefore, if you, you know, you, you remember that m was initially of size n squared and n squared is at worst t cubed. And what you get therefore is that uh, this uh, initial object, which is the second moment average, is of size t to the 3 half minus 3 over 20. And so if you take the square root, you get the bound of 3 fourth minus 3 over 40. Right. So we know, we, we realize that there is much more that we can do. And at this point, we have already obtained the 3 over 40 saving. And so in the next few slides, we are going to improve upon that saving. Okay, I'll just pause here for some time in case you have any questions. Why, why did we use duality to switch the variables? Uh, because uh, we want to apply a Poisson formula at some point, and we know that if it's a longer length of variable, then Poisson will help us, right? Because you get conductor over the original length. If the original length is long, uh, dual summation formula will help you. That's pretty much. Yeah, please use mic to ask questions maybe. Uh, so are there any other questions? All right. All right. So let's move on and let's uh, show you how you get uh, saving beyond what is already known. And so once again, going back to uh, all of this, uh, we will have a certain summation like this. 
uh, as it was written on the last slide. And now the idea will be to open the absolute value squared and apply Poisson formula like we did on the last slide. And so when you open the absolute value squared, uh, things will cancel out in the diagonal. The oscillations in the diagonal term will cancel out. And therefore you don't really have a lot of hope of improving on the diagonal term. So if you apply the Poisson formula, the m equal to zero contribution is precisely what you get last time. You get a saving of size m, which totally in all gives you a contribution of size n cubed over q cubed. So uh, out of the saving of size n, you get this contribution. But now we have we want to do something more to the off diagonal terms. Uh, the off diagonal terms, the dual m sum is it turns out to be of length uh, q cubed over n. And in order to calculate that, you see you have a double q sum uh, and a double h sum. Therefore, the conductor is going to be of size you know q squared multiplied by the oscillations of the h uh, of, of the size of h and then divided by this n squared over q cubed. Once again, you can do that arithmetic and see that the size is q cubed over n. And then uh, you will, of course, have a certain uh, character sums. You will have certain integral transforms. Uh, you can bound the character sums and you can apply stationary phase analysis. And roughly speaking, you will have a sum of certain size. Uh, there is going to be a certain uh, factor coming uh, up top and you have the betas coming out of the uh, duality principle. Uh, you have these exponent coming because of uh, the Poisson formula, and you have a certain oscillation in this exponent. Uh, this oscillation is going to be of size n over q squared. And at this point, what we have not quite utilized is the savings coming out of, or the cancellations coming out of the q sums. But notice that we have these unknown coefficients in the q sum, and somehow if we want to get saving in the q variable, we want to get rid of these uh, unknown coefficients. And in order to do that, we first apply reciprocity. So what is reciprocity? If you give me two co-prime integers a and b, then the e, uh, exponent of one over a b, the, the complex exponent of one over a b is equal to e of a bar over b times e of b bar over a, where a bar is the inverse of a mod b and b bar is the inverse of b mod a. And we will need that because uh, going back to the last slide, notice that this Q1 and Q2 are appearing in the denominators over here. And we want to do something with the Q1 and Q2 sums. And we apply reciprocity. And if we apply reciprocity of Q1 mod MH1 bar and Q2 mod MH2 bar, uh, notice that these Q1 bar Q2 appears here and this MH1 appears in the, in the denominator and Q2 bar Q1 appears here and MH2 in the denominator. And this Q2 over MH1, Q1, and Q1 over MH2, Q2, now notice that they are flat. That's because you should expect Q1 and Q2 are of similar size, and MH1 is bigger than 1. So you can absorb these things in the weight function. Right? So you apply reciprocity in order to make sure that you can apply a Poisson formula or a cauchy schwarz inequality to the Q sum. But you still have these beta coefficients, so you want to get rid of these beta coefficients. And you do that using cauchy schwarz inequality. And you do, we, we actually end up applying uh, an infinite, uh, uh, infinitely many times uh, cauchy schwarz Poisson kind of a combination. So what we do here is uh, because we want to get rid of one of the betas, we take out the M sum, which is like the, either, either the N or the R sum. We take out the H sums as well, and we take only one, out, uh, one of the Q1 sums outside. So that the beta is killed. Uh, you apply the cauchy schwarz inequality, so there is a factor which encodes the length of the summations, and you have all of this remaining thing inside. And now if you open the absolute value squared, you have two copies of the Q sum. Right? Uh, and now what happens is you have, because you have two copies of Q2 sum, let's say Q21 and Q22, you can repeat the process. You can take out, let's say, Q21, and then uh, the Q22 is inside, and you'll have two copies of Q22. And then you can keep doing that and keep getting savings. So at this point, if we apply the cauchy schwarz inequality and we, uh, you know, uh, see what the, uh, you know, of course, apply Poisson formula to the Q1 sum and see what the savings are, uh, the total saving that you obtain is of going to be of size n squared over QT squared to the one half. But because it's inside the square root, the saving is of size one quarter. You apply one more Poisson formula, uh, sorry, you apply one more cauchy schwarz inequality, there's another square root. So you get another saving, but now the saving is half the size. So it's not uh, to the one fourth, it's of size to the one eighth. 
And so you keep repeating that process of Cauchy Schwartz boson, Cauchy Schwartz boson to the copies of the Q sum. And in all, you should get the saving of uh, to the one fourth, to the one eighth, to, to the one sixteenth. Uh, that basically adds up to the saving of n squared over qt squared to the one half. And so that's the extra saving that we are able to get in order to improve this exponent over here. Uh, just to end this, uh, let me show you that uh, we will have to analyze some bad looking or some well, funny looking, nice looking character sums. Uh, for example, in the first iteration, we just have a Klusterman sum, but in the second iteration, we have more involved sums. Uh, the character sum looks like gamma mod C, where this A, B1, B2, B3, uh, Q1, Q2, all of these are uh, certain variables. Uh, and then if you open the Klusterman sum as well, you will have a, a, sum, a, a sum which is of, uh, you, you'll have a triple sum. Basically, you'll have a gamma mod C, you'll have some other sum mod C and a some other sum mod C and uh, you will have to analyze those big character sums. And uh, to analyze those big character sums, there are well-developed theories where you can uh, analyze those uh, exponential sums. For that, uh, you can draw out the Newton polyhedra for all of those. And then you will have to, you, you know, you'll have the degenerate case and you'll have the generic cases. The degenerate cases are fewer and you can bound those. In the generic case, you will have to analyze being more careful. Uh, you can use the theory uh, developed by Dwork and then Adolson and Sperber, and you get some Newton polyhedra, and you will have to analyze each face of the polyhedron and then bound the sum and basically get that this character sum is bounded by square root of the size. Uh, for each iteration of Cauchy Schwartz and Poisson, this uh, Newton polyhedron grows. And so we use like an induction kind of argument to make sure that uh, the sums and that the character sums that we obtain are nicely bounded. All right. And so the final bounds, uh, n cubed over q cubed was appearing from the, from the uh, diagonal term. The off diagonal gives us this kind of a thing. And once again, the last step is to just match all the sizes so that you get that the length of the short second moment is of size t to the two over three. And that gives you this exponent of t to the five. Point. And that gives us the exponent of, you know, take the square root, you get the exponent of t to the five eighth, which is three fourth minus one eighth. And so uh, uh, this is the last slide I'll leave you with that. Uh, the, the algorithm here was to start with the second moment and apply approximate functional equation, uh, then apply the Delta symbol, then apply dual summation formulas to the shift and the two sums that were appearing. Uh, then we have to analyze a bunch of integral transforms using uh, stationary phase analysis, for example. Uh, then we apply cauchy schwartz inequality while taking the H and Q sum outside. So we are taking out the shorter sum while putting the, uh, the larger sums, the longer sums inside. But then we swap those out by using the duality principle. Uh, at that point, uh, we can apply a Poisson formula because we have broken the symmetry. So we do that. Uh, we cannot do much about the diagonal term. So we bound the diagonal term. And for the off diagonal term, uh, we do this uh, thing of reciprocity and then an infinite Cauchy Schwartz and Poisson formula in order to get more and more saving. And that's all, folks. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Keshav. So uh, really impressive stuff. Um, Thank you. Yeah, very nice talk, very nice result. So are there any questions? Yeah, so for that last uh, thing, you begin your induction proof of that from n equal to second stage? Yes. Because otherwise you don't need that also scoba. You, you, we begin uh, from here. Actually, Rito Brother and I used much, much easier version for our L half F where we use the Newton polyhedra. I mean, he wrote up that portion. I don't know. Uh, yeah, but uh, over here, we do end up needing uh, like an induction kind of an argument. Uh, so you can't begin in that one, right? Uh, unfortunately not. Maybe, maybe there is uh, someone who can develop like a large sieve kind of an argument where you are able to bound all of this together. Okay, thank you. It's a very nice thing. Okay. So you think this is the limit of this method? I don't know. That will be good to explain. I see. Okay. okay. Yeah, thank you for the very nice uh, impressive talk. And uh, so what is Adolfson's Sperber? 
So Edison yeah. and Sperber basically uh, were estimating uh, very general exponential sums where uh, you have, of course, the Vedalin bound, but you have to make sure that this uh, Vedalin bound of square root cancellation works. Uh, the Vedalin bound, for example, we know for Klusterman, but for more general exponential sums, it had to be developed. And uh, I'm not an expert in this subject, uh, but what I know is that uh, there was uh, these uh, theory de developed by Dwork, and then Adolson and Sperber uh, extended his uh, cohomology theory uh, from, I think, p addicts to any general exponential sums. So the idea is basically, as you see on this slide, uh, on this slide you have a very general character sum. And you cannot uh, just uh, straight away bound this by using uh, older theories. You need uh, more involved tools that were developed later on. And so they have uh, these tools. Uh, they actually went ahead and they bounded more general exponential sums twisted with Dirichlet characters. So if someone is doing, let's say in this problem, a GL3 cross GL1, a second moment, they might end up having a bunch of character sums that have uh, Dirichlet characters. And then you might have to use, uh, you know, if, if you follow this algorithm, you might have to use uh, those kind of bounds on these twisted exponential sums. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so I was wondering why you, why you cannot take out both Q1 and Q2 some apply the Cauchy search to get out beta Q1 and beta Q2. Can you go to the previous yeah. slides? Go back. Uh, Right. So why can't you take out both, both Q1, Q1 and Q2? The modular is getting too large for poison? Uh, you will just end up killing all the oscillations, I believe. No, because if you're putting H1 sum and M sum inside. So you, you want to leave the M and H sum inside? Uh, but then they're in the denominator, right? Uh, that's the reason we applied reciprocity to make sure that. So, so once you applied reciprocity, the M and H are in the denominator. So Cauchy-Schwarz is not the end of it. After Cauchy-Schwarz, you then apply a Poisson. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. No, but you can still apply the poison, but I think the model will be quite large to get yeah. some saving, yeah. I mean, but I think there are a lot of avenues to play around with this and see what you get. So maybe worth experimenting this. Way. Yeah, I have one comment. Yes. I don't think any functional analysis. So many times, Kochi shows in a single proof. <laughs> well, I've used it infinitely. Yeah. Many I have never times. seen one. We have used infinitely many times. Oh. If, if Can you use the microphone because we cannot hear? So if you replace pi by an unsustained series, so this will like be related to the sixth moment of zeta. Right, right. So will will that give you something? That that's interesting actually, and I don't know. I'll have to do the calculations to see what we get. But uh, let me also mention a which is result. A which calculates sixth moment. Uh, and the bound that he gets is actually, so he calculates the full sixth moment, not you know, the short sixth moment, right? Okay. And then he gets exactly the same bound, phi over eight. Now the full sixth moment, uh, of course, is bigger than the short sixth moment. So uh, you can expect, I guess, the same bound, but maybe with much more difficulty. Nice, nice talk. Thanks. Is the mic. So, uh, when you apply poison over this QI variable, right. so you have a, uh, uh, these are um, uh, QI variable coming from the delta, right? Yes, from the delta. Sentence. So, uh, you have to know the derivative of G function with respect to Q variable, right? right. Uh, so, how that uh, uh, oscillates with respect to Q? 
So uh, you you have good bounds, right? In this, uh, the bounds uh, are uh, calculated uh, even in this book of Ivanir and Kowalski. And no, they calculate in uh, another way. G Q X with respect to X variable they calculate, not the with respect to Q variable. I think. Um, oh wait a second. I think at this point we have already killed out even the G. Uh, when you are taking out uh, the Q1 sum, I think you can even take out the GQ X. Oh, I see. You are killing that. Uh, yeah, you you will. Yeah, sorry. Good. Uh, good question. Thanks. Okay. Uh, you will end up killing even the GQ X part. I see. You can just take it out. And it's just bounded by QDX. Okay. Bounded. Yeah, that is. Okay. You're good to go. Yeah, because we don't need mm. cancellations from the X integral. Right? Just take it out. You're not using off list. Not using. So, just a small thing. Um, here you have HI is of size QIT capital N, but the Q2 is in size. So maybe you want to say capital Q instead of Q2, right? Yes. There is no Q2 outside, but the condition uses the Q2, which appears later. Yeah, it should be big QT over N. So the H yeah. is bigger, but thankfully you have enough small Qs so that you, you, this is not an issue. Uh, thanks. Yeah, it should have been a big QT over N. Any more questions? Maybe remarks? I, I can't hear anything, uh, so I take it as a no. Uh, so then let's uh, call it a day. Uh, let's uh, thank Keshav again for the wonderful talk and uh, the result.